Yeah, my name is uh, Bjorn Ture Tarlsen. I work as a pro uh, project manager for the SDK teams uh, at Nordic. And today I should present, uh, we should present uh, both NRF52 and also we have Christoph here that will follow and present around SDK. So we will go into and have a look at what's new on the 52 compared to what we had on the 51. So that's the kind of scope of this one. Okay, here you have a block overview of uh, how the 52 looked like. And as you see in red there now, it's a lot of new stuff. Everything in red is added compared to 51. It's important now to understand that some of the things I'll talk about is not available or not functional in the, in the engineering sample. But for that, you can look up in the router documentation. It will tell you. Uh, and as you see, we have added a lot of new features uh, and upgraded some of the existing. So for the serial boxes, you see we have read both for TVI and UART. And uh, I2C, I2S, sorry, and then no, and then we added I2S and, and PDM. We have a new ADC and we have NFC. In addition to memory, cache, and CPU. So it's uh, better, more performance, improved, and yeah. Anyways. First, we can look at uh, CPU. If you get some key things there, you see that it has uh, improved by adding the M4F. F here is for floating point. Uh, it's improved significant compared to the M0. It's also, it's a different architecture. So it is able to cache data and code simultaneously. Uh, more advanced instruction set and have uh, support for brown speculation, as you see. And also, there are some more uh, functionality that is here that we haven't had on the previous one. Uh, and if you look at the floating point processor itself, you see it's a lot of, it's this IIII 745 compliant. And you have like three cycle multi accumulate and 14 cycle divide square root. So you can do a lot more math with this one compared to the M0. And it's the same, more or less the same number as Thomas presented earlier today. That it has 2.5 to 20 compared to an M0 of floating point. And if you then look at uh, the changes directly compared to 51. You see that uh, the 51, we have one heart fault. And you don't know exactly what causes it. In 52, this is four, four different. So you can know that it's a heart fault, non global It's a memory management, this fault, the usage fault. And you can handle them, handle them individually. So you have much more knowledge at that level. Also, another important thing is that 51 runs on 16 megahertz, while 52 runs on the 64 megahertz. But for the peripheral bus, they are the same. They both run on 16 megahertz. That uh, needs synchronization. And also, you need to keep special attention there when you write code for status, because it could not be the situation you think it is when you start writing. So like clearing interrupt, you should always read back to ensure that it's finished with the clearing before you proceed. So this kind of thing needs to be taken care of. But I think that's known to people working with this arm 
architecture. Interrupt controller. Uh, the M4 supports 240 compared to 32 that we had on that. So we much bigger interpector. Uh, latency, 12 cycles. But it also supports tail chaining here. Also need to take attention there if you use the floating point. Because there it needs to take care of or push more registers. Uh, not 100% sure, but I think we have an issue on the, on the early software stack. And use, we have an application using floating point, and that one doesn't support it. I think this is a problem. Maybe some of you know about it already. Yes, memory. Of course, more memory on, uh, on the new one, 512. Uh, and we have a cache. That's not available on the preview kit, but will be in the final version. Instruction buffer and yeah, up to two weight states, six, four megahertz without cache. Yep. For RAM, we have now added four more blocks. So it's 64 to double the RAM compared to the biggest we have in 51. And it's 16 4K blocks that could be individually controlled when it comes to power, but it's divided into eight HAB bus slaves. And this is, the 16 is important for power, the eight is important when you want to use different peripheral and ECDMA. Because each peripheral could access, as long as they don't share the same eight blocks here, they can work in parallel. So you can push data. And if the CPU also pushes something, it is, has to be on a different, otherwise they have to wait for each other. So that you need to take care of. Also, one other thing here is the RAM is both available on the code and on the memory bus at the same time. So it's, it's just mirrored to see the same RAM in the code space as you see in the data space meaning it's easier to run code from RAM. You need to administrate how things are, where things are put. Debugging, there we have added some more features. Of course we have the normal SVD to face two pins, dedicated pins. Uh, in addition we have added uh, one Asynchronous serial wire output, SPO, that grabs one of the GPIOs. And we also have a four bit parallel trace port that also grabs some of the GPIOs. Can be used, but they cannot be used at the same time. They are conflicting with SVO. So it's a lot of more debug facilities compared to what we had on M0 or on the 51. Uh, power supply or input power on the 52 is improved. While we on the 51 had three modes of operation, either if you have a low voltage mode, you have to put it, make your PCB one way. If you run with a DC-DC, one way and then the full range another way. For 52 it's only one way of putting it up. It's one circuit and it covers from 1.7 to 3.6 voltage. So it's simpler in that sense. And it works down to 1.7 compared to 51 that works down to 1.8. Power management. Uh, as Thomas mentioned, it's fully automated. 
this works out of the box. The only thing you need to take care of is starting, enabling starting the different peripherals or whatever you need. Turn them off again when you don't need them. And the rest is taken care of under the hood, both for giving the clock and power, and also controlling the power regulator as needed. And if you look at the numbers then, yeah, maybe you recognize it from, from Thomas's slides, but there you see the number we have. Uh, so system one having the 32 running is 1.6 or 1.8, depending on if you're running that crystal or not. If you don't use any RAM going system off, you have 400 non-amp. And you have 40 non-amp per 4K block. Uh, if you then look at some active modes, if you do CPU prime number, say it's 4.4 milliamp running. Or if you do it core mark, it's five, so depending on which code you're running. Sorry. You also see differences here between running with or without the DC DC. So you more or less halving the current consumption when you're turning on the DC DC. As you said, this is measured on three volt supply running on 64 megahertz. And it's measured on the engineering sample, not on the final product. So it could maybe change a bit. But the numbers we think look promising at least. Clock system. Here is a small difference compared to 51. Uh, we don't have, uh, we only uh, provide 32 megahertz crystal. And we don't have an RC option as we had on 51. So here you're actually running the PLL with or without the crystal, lock to the crystal. And without is equivalent to the RC. Uh, an improvement here compared to 51 as then when you start without the crystal and turning on the crystal, it, you don't get this glitch of a one to two clock cycle that we had on 51. So it's, it's more seamlessly switching source, as is also tried to illustrate down here. Um, also, important to see that whether or not you should use the crystal has to be controlled by software. It's not automatically taken care of. And one of the reasons there is that the crystal has some startup time, and that could depend from the crystal to crystal. It's some variation at least, and it takes some, so long time that you need to handle this in software anyway. You, know, to, you need to know the application. And there is some documentation telling which peripheral that strictly need the crystal or not. That should be stated in the documentation. <coughs> Chip IO. Not that much new here. It's uh, 32 GPIO, same as uh, 51. Uh, eight is dedicated for analog. And they're shared by the ADC, the new comparator, and the LP comparator. And rest here is more or less the same as we had with the configuration of strength and pull down, pull up, all these things. Since we have a functionality called latch that is new, uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, everyone, all the IP, uh, GPIO can be connected to PPI, same as 51. So there is, the last line here is a new one, the reset. Default, there are no reset pin on the 52. But it could, through configuration in the UACR, be routed to PO21. So you could, but then you also occupy a GPIO. But now the user could select whether you want that reset pin or not. 
default is off. GPR task event, very much the same. Generate on polling. So it has event and, and tasks. An event can be generated on falling and rising edge. Same. And here, the filter is default off. But it needs to be kept running. And we have the port event with the sense. And here is an added feature of latch. So you can, I think you read, have to read upon the details, but there you can latch so you're not missing any of the toggling of the pins. For output, it's the same task out, but we have added a set and a clear. That's two new tasks added for GPIO. Reason for that is, or one of the issues we have seen is that making a PVM with the GPIO task event, and if you miss one of the event, you can or change or revert the polarity of the output. This could be saved or, or make it more safe with set and clear. So for summary for the GPIO task event, you see it's eight channel versus four. So it's four more channels. And we have added set and clear and latch. So that's the new stuff for 52. PPI that you have used before. And if you look at this, it's looking the same. We have tasks in that could come from a PPI or for, from software writing to the task register. We have end coming out that could be interrupts or routed to the PPI. And we have short within one, each peripherals. That's the same. And if you then summarize, we have added four more channels. So instead of 16, now it's 20 channels. So you can set up more. The pre programmed channel is the same. Uh, maybe not that visible for you that uses soft devices because at least the BLE software was uses many of these. Channel groups to group PPI channels for enabling disabling. There you have seconds from four to six. And then we have added something called fork. That is a function on all 32 channels. And I will give you an input on what fork is. It will save you some channels, actually. So in 51, if you want to trig two tasks in two different peripherals from one event, you have to use two channels. While in 52, this could be, you can use the fork and actually fan out uh, to two different peripherals. So each of them shall have a fork, so you can route it to two different peripherals from the same channel. Then it's a radio. Maybe from outside it doesn't look as a big improvement on the radio, but actually this is a totally new radio. We have worked, for, worked on for many years, actually. Uh, so 51, to recap, it's, it's a 4.0 compatible, running to 51 mega and 2 megabits and also aren't compliant one megabit. We have, yeah, this on the fly packet assembly, dynamic payload length, data whitening, PPI support, and we have ECDMA and RSSI. It's just a, for 52, it's a completely new radio, as I said. <clears throat> it's 4.2 compliant. So it's, we have added some features to make it compliant with the new Bluetooth specification. It's uh, backwards compatible. It was able to, when we had the first version out, we took the soft device, just started it, 
and it worked, more or less. Of course, it was, there was a problem there, but it worked. So it's pretty compatible. It's improved when it comes to current consumption. We'll give you some number on that. So it's lower peak. DC-DC is improved. The match is improved a lot. You see the number of components needed for 52 is much less than we had on 51 and should be easier to tune. It's an on-ship balloon. We have improved RSSI. And this is a closed loop compared to an open loop that we have on 51. So if you look at some of the numbers here, just so the RF interface now, it's a single-ended with an on-ship balloon. So the number of components is now two, I think. Maybe three, but I think two is enough. And that's all you need, and you get the performance. Link budget is increased, so we the sensitivity and the output. 51, we stated four. Struggled a lot with the match, and we have seen the end of four, but we often also see close to three, so there was something in between. And it was very depending on the layout of the antenna match. While on, on 52, we will state that we have four. Uh, peak current on uh, 51, we had, if you run the DC DC, we saw just below 10. and RX and 8 on TX, while we now have close to 5 on both. It's improved a lot. Startup time is improved. So now we can switch the radio. Improve the blocking and crystal frequency. Now we only run on 32. We have only one option. Uh, packet length is the same. It says 258 on 51, or I think that's wrong. I think it's 254. But. And also TX mode now is changed because this is a closed loop, it's an open. Earlier you can just transmit for a certain time, then you have to restart the radio. For this one you can just send as long as you want. Uh, for 52 we have removed one mode, so it's no longer possible to run 250 kilobit. But we kept one and two megabit. Deviation is the same. And alloy leakage has improved. Six dB. And it should be simpler to, to get this because of the simple match. So some summarizing this is of course, the startup is 137 microseconds compatible. So we, need, we can put it into a backwards compatible mode. If not, it starts at 40. We also have added, I don't know if this is interesting here, but we have added a new mode in the radio, so it's possible to run it on 2360 to 2460 instead of 240 to 25. So it meets another requirements. RSSI, it's improved the range, and it's not connected directly to sending or receiving packet. Okay, always on. We also lower the voltages that the radius runs on, so it makes it more, so it's capable of getting the numbers we want for the current consumption. As I said, it's yeah, 55 nanometer and it's closed loop. Improvement. Then we are on peripherals. For timers, uh, two type of timers, RTC, haven't changed functionality, the same as we had on 51, and a normal timer, also pretty much the same. Uh, but in addition, we have a third timer that's uh, the cystic timer. However, we don't recommend to use this one, or we, at least you should know what you're doing. Uh, 
because it will stop. This is uh, the cystic timer that is given by ARM. So summarizing on this is uh, we have now three RTCs compared to two on 51. So we added one more RTC. Apart from that, they have the same functionality. For timer, we have added two more timers. So now it's five timers in total. And we have also fixed the <coughs> bit width on two of the existing timers. So instead of eight to 16, it's now also added 24 and 32 bit. Functionality-wise, they are equal. Um, AES engine, there we haven't done much. It's uh, giving the same functionality as 51. Um, yeah. ECB, CCM, and AAR. Uh, yeah. ECDMA, there we have done, added one more function that is, uh, could be interesting. It's something we call list or autolog. So configuring uh, ECDMA, set a pointer, max, and you get back amount in the buffer. Start, stop it. But also you have now the list function. We'll come back to how to use that one. This is maybe known to the one I used 51. Just set up where in the RAM you want and how much you should set aside. Then you get a feedback on how many bytes you have received. Same if you have a kind of bi-directional like, like TVI, you can have both an RX and a TX or a new art. And then you added autolog. And that's make, it's connected to the SPIM and the TVIM. And that makes it possible to collect data uh, several times without involving the CPU. So you can set up the DMA where to start, and then you can set the auto log to how many bytes you should jump on the next start of the module. So you can set a timer to trig, periodically trig the TVM, read out some data, and then it does that over and over again, and then after X number of times, you need to control that. It's no maxim max there for a number of tries. So that could be controlled maybe by a compare on the timer. Then you can get X number of readout without involving the CPU. That's the way of use case thinking around this. So if you then look at this, is is setting up. And then you start, and then you start from the first point of percent. And you start it again after some time, then he changes the start point of the DMA with a 2N and so on. And this one is only connected to SPIM and TVIM. Serial interfaces. And that's involving UART, SPI, and TVI. And if you have a summary there now, it's four instances. One that contains UART. It's the old UART and a UART E. And for serial box one, zero, one, and two, it contains, for the two first one, SPI and TVI both master-slave and the old implementation. What you're seeing red there now is the one you find in 51. And the guidance from, from us is that for new implementation, you should not use the old one. But the default startup, when you start it up, is like that. So existing code will run out of the box. Trivial full duplex, peer-to-peer, -peer, master and a slave and the master with autolog, in addition to ECDMA, and the legacy. Eight megabit, 
uh, top of my head, I think the 51 was 4, 204. Uh, chip select handled by hardware for in master yes, not on SPI slave. That's the same as 51. And we have three instances. TBI. There we support 100, 250, and 400 kilobits. Don't remember top of my head, but I think the speed here is improved. Uh, we have all the legacy and TVS and TVM has CCDMA and master with auto lock. Clock stretching is supported. But that also was the case in 51. UART. We have the old UART and we have UART E. Then new thing, oh, new thing here is ECDMA. So now you have a UART where you can put data directly to RAM. And you also for UART E has improved the baud rate generator, so it's more accurate. But we have kept for all UART, it is as it was on 51 for backward compatibility. QDEC, more or less the same. It's uh, added some events, possible some tasks, shortcuts, but apart from that, it's exactly the same functionality as we had on 51. Uh, and then the ADC converter. Is why do we change? So it's a new technology. Autonomy, it added ECDMA, scan and limits, new functionality. It's up to 200 kilo kilohertz, so it's much faster than we had on 51. So it's uh, much more useful. I've got a lot of questions around that, so now it's improved on speed. And resolution, it's no more than 10 bit no be. So we can actually get, I get told, 12 bit out of it if you handle it correctly with oversampling. So it's a totally new and improved ADC compared to what we had earlier. Um, yes, and a block schematic of the ADC. Here is now ECDMA, so you can push it directly to RAM, setting it up. And you are able to do something called scan mode, so you can set up each channel individually and just trigger it, and it will sample all the different uh, channels in one shot, giving a result from multiple ADC channels. And I think even you can put different channels on the same pin. So you can share pin between channels and set it up differently. So if you have an example of one, you can just set it up, do a sample, one, and do another sample, triggered either by software or, or by timer, and you get the result just in, in the RAM as you set up the DMA. Or you can also set it in scan mode, and you set up X number of channels, Start the sample, and it will just start collecting from all the channels you set up, and put it in RAM. And you can repeat that also, and just filling in the results. And as I said, each channel can be configured differently. And also, we have something called limit, so you can set it up, running and sampling over and over again without involving CPU at all, and then you can get triggered by results reaching certain limits at the lower, low limit or high limit, or both. <coughs> so there's some added functionality there compared to what we had earlier. Comparator this is a new one. We haven't had before. You can uh, set it up. Not actually very 
known, the, known this very well. I haven't worked with it, but uh, set it up either as comparing between two, or you can set it up as a current source, so you can implement touch with it. And it could uh, detect yeah, both rising, falling, and any edge. And the pin here can also be compared, it could set to the same as ADC at the same time. So it could be shared pins together with ADC if you want. And it could be run in three power modes using, also the current usage is different, but also the performance is different. So it's different use cases. LP comp. Almost the same, single edge operation. We added uh, four bit resolution instead of three. And we have added uh, hysteresis mode on the 52 compared to what we have in 51. We also added some new reference voltages, but it's organized in a way that it's backward compatible. So the existing one is from zero to seven, and the new one comes from eight to 12, 15 here meaning the existing code running on 51 will work out of the box on this one. NFC, I will not tell you much about NFC. It's a module added there, but Christoph will tell you more about NFC functionality afterwards. Then we have audio serial interfaces, two of them, PDM and I2S. The PDM is a two-wire digital audio interface. So it uh, could add up to a microphone on two wires. And we have the uh, general master operation PDM clock generated by 52. So, and it's uh, built-in digital PDM to PCM filter. And I2S, for full duplex synchronous peer-to-peer -peer interface. So this is for interfacing codecs. Uh, it's both master and slave operation, simultaneously RX, TX. So we can have 8, 16, and 24-bit sample width, and different sample rates, and local clock generator. And then uh, this one, SVI, I've used. That's existing feature, not changed at all. So five software interrupts, triggering interrupts by setting the pending bit in the NVIC. It's the same. But we have added something called EGU unit, and it's put on top, meaning it's occupied the same register set as SVI. It's a totally new module, put on top six, six instances. And this one gives you 16 sources. So it's some the same, but it has tasks and event system built in. So it's each instance has 16 trig tasks registers. So you can have one interrupt vector, but 16 sources. So it gives you more flexibility. And it could also be hooked up to the PPI system. That was not the case for, for uh, SVR. So actually, when you look at it, it looked <coughs> like this. So you have either a writing to a task, 0 to 15 for one instance, or you can hook up a PPI. And all it does, it, it's routed out either to PPI or to generate interrupt through an event. It could be a powerful set and uh, improve handling between software and hardware. Memory watch unit, that's new. Mostly used in, in debug environment, I think, but could be very useful when you have problem. So it's caches read-write, uh, read-write or read-write operation. You can put it in six region, 
four are programmable, two are fixed. So there you can set it up to watch some area in, in your memory and you get triggered if something happens. And instead it has replaced the RAM and peripheral section in MPU for 51. But it cannot be used to, uh, oh, sorry, get it. Then last one, PVM. So it's a fully automatic glitch free PVM generator. That's new, totally new peripheral. And each of them have uh, four synchronous PVM channels. And we have three instances of this in the 52. So you have three PVM modules. And it also could be use DMA to set it up. So you can do a lot of different configuration and it could switch between different configuration on the fly, catching, catching it from, from RAM. So this one is powerful and could be set up to work without involving CPU. And kind of use cases there is like we see at least RGB lead, lead fading service control, DC motors, simple LCDs and low quality audios like in to toys. <laughs> <laughs>